Am I on? Can you? Yay, hello. Hello, welcome to um, the Art of Firewatch, which I've just been instructed to tell you is similar to the Art of War, the Art of Feng Shui. So this is essentially we're beginning a cult today. Um, so can you uh, welcome, in an enthusiastic style, uh, uh, Ollie Moss and James Benson from Campo Santo? Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Have seats. I should probably say I'm John Walker from Rock, Paper, Shotgun. Ooh. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, thanks. thanks for having us. Yeah, yes. thanks for coming. So the idea of today is I want to sort of find out, uh, I should say, that uh, Ollie is an animator artist, artist animator. Explain who you are. Ollie? You've, you've, got, you've done it all wrong already. This is Come on, Ollie. Who are you? What do you do? <laughs> uh, I'm a graphic designer and I sort of art directed Firewatch. And James? And I'm an animator and game designer. And I did those things on it. And James, last night, won a BAFTA. Oh, yeah. Thank and you. He didn't, he didn't <laughs> get to receive a round of applause. It wasn't just me. There was a team. A team won a BAFTA. But it yes. was basically you, though, it was wasn't mostly, it? <laughs> it was mostly me. That's true. So um, what I want to get out of today is to figure out um, how many arts do you need to make a game, which is better art or animation, yeah. maybe hopefully have a fight. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, is yeah. the plan. I want to explore Firewatch. I want to think about, um, hopefully you guys have played Firewatch. Uh, you want to put out a spoiler warning just in case, or should yeah, we try and get, avoid? It's going to get spoilery. Yes, it's going to get Not spoilery. super intentional, but because it's a conversation, who knows what could happen. Mm -hmm. happen. Yeah. So Anything could no happen. No limits. Yeah. Uh, so we're, um, yeah, just explore Firewatch. And then, so for like the first half of the session, I want to just chat to these guys and find out how they got into it, how Firewatch ended up looking like it does. Um, and then I want to open it up to the floor for Q&A, and so start thinking of really difficult questions now. That would be amazing. So I guess I want to start with, um, so just tell me your background. So James, what's your background? How did you get to Firewatch? Um, oof. So, uh, I started learning animation from like YouTube videos, and oh. then I taught myself animation that way. And then I got a job at Lionhead, the now defunct, destroyed, obliterated Lionhead. Um, and worked there for a little bit on uh, Fable and the ill-fated boy simulator, Project Milo, um, if anyone remembers <laughs> that. And then... Um, Tell us some stories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can we pivot into a Milo talk? Yeah. <laughs> <That's what I laughs> think. Uh, that blew up uh, for obvious reasons, and then I made YouTube videos and stuff for a bit. And then I made uh, Ori in the Blind Forest for quite a while. And then I... Uh, I think Jake... Yeah, one of the co-founders of Comsanto basically contacted me because of my YouTube videos. So YouTube is basically the main mm. way to get the jobs you want in this industry. We, uh, you did a, a video where you reanimated Half-Life. Yeah, I, I made like a Half-Life 1 trailer with uh, all of the technological constraints of 1998, but with up-to-date animation. And so that was a first-person thing, and they were like, mm. that's what we want in this game. Amazing. So mm. yeah, that's my thing. How about you, Ollie? Uh, nepotism. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, um, I knew Jake through the internet. Uh, we both liked each other's work. I loved uh, Sam and Max season three from Telltale. I think I started <laughs> tweeting about it because I felt like that was before The Walking Dead and I felt like Telltale was still this really small thing that not many people really knew about. So I was a, I was a big Sam and Max booster. And then I think um, Jake knew my work from just around you know, like design blogs and whatnot and we got in touch and we just stayed friends. He's, um, he's got a really good eye and I found that he was a really good person to show stuff I was working on because he gave me very sort of like no nonsense feedback on it, um, and those people are like really rare. Uh, so we just kind of stayed in contact, and then when he and Sean left Telltale to start their own thing, they asked if I'd be interested in making a game, and I was. So, Can you know. we just get a show of hands? How many people here have played at the Summer Firewatch? Wow, look That's at that! Yeah. It's all money in your pockets, guys. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, okay, so people have a good idea of the art style, and I think it's fair to say it's pretty distinct. It's uh, it's. You know, you can immediately identify it from many other similar styles of games, I, hope I so, guess. Yeah. Mm. Um, so, what I, the question I have is: if, so, you're making a game. You've got uh, Jake and Sean essentially at the top for company. Yeah. Um, and oh, yeah. it's their vision, this game, right? So, uh, Sean has this idea of the story he wants to tell. It's. I'd actually. I mean, it is fundamentally uh, uh, the the very sort of like rough kernel of the game existed, like when they got together and stuff. They just but. It was very much like we want to make a game about a guy in a forest and he does things. We didn't know yeah. what they were, but everybody on the team contributed in like a huge way to what it ended up being. Not just on a sort of like facile level. It was like the core of it would be totally different if like any wow. single person on the team had. had yeah, changed. I think that's very true. I mean, obviously yeah. the game wouldn't look what it looks like if Ollie didn't make it, <laughs> for example. Um, 
Yeah, and like I guess if I hadn't been there, they'd be, they might have done less of the first-person awareness stuff and that kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, it was always going to be like I think it was always going to be set in Wyoming. Yeah, it was always certain that was, visual yeah, key was, things like that. Hmm. Yeah. So the, the question I have, I said, I guess, is how much of yourself can you bring to the project, or how much do you have to adapt yourself to it? So uh, when someone else is, it's someone else's vision. Hmm. How does uh, how to say start with an artist? How does an artist come into that vision and yeah. be accepted? I mean, I. It is someone else's vision, but on the other hand, it was like, I've always wanted to make a game that looked a bit like this, so it was sort of selfishly, you know, like, <laughs> selfishly, what if it looked like my work? <laughs> <laughs> so um, that was kind of how we went about it. I pitched them some rough ideas that, I, you know, because I've, my work has always been, um, especially the, the work that I was doing around when Firewatch started, um, started being made, was, like, inspired by the old, like, Sea America posters and the, the old travel posters, and I wanted to bring some of that into the game, especially sort of, like, the camera... Or, or the distance like pulled out, I wanted it to get more stylized into the distance because at the heart of it, it's still this sort of um, very sort of uh, systemic first person game where you're looking, you have to look at things up close so it can't be like that stylized across the whole thing. But the idea was to make something that again, that just got more stylized away from, as, as it yeah. okay. moved out of the, uh, the actual gameplay areas, I suppose. Yeah, and Ollie's stuff is, was like used to kind of draw me into the project, because I was, I was working somewhere else, and mm -hmm. they would sort of make it seem enticing. They just sort of spammed me with all the things that Ollie was painting. As we drew you away from a BAFTA winning <laughs> art studio to work on, <laughs> um, <laughs> work on all nonsense. Yeah, but so it sort mm -hmm. of has that effect too as well. It's like kind of a talent draw as well. Um, so. Yeah, all this stuff is quite foundational. Um, for me, I, I'd never made an adventure game before. I was used to making, so like Orin by Forest, if anyone doesn't know, that's what I made previously, it was, it's like a very action heavy, um, sort of press a button or something crazy happens kind of game. 2D platformer. Yeah, is it's that a 2D fair? platformer, yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, so making, and I'd actually never made a first person game before. So I'd never done professional first person animation. Um, so I had to, everything in Fire, which is very kind of like lumbering, I guess. Like mm -hmm. Henry is not, particularly fit or capable in really any aspect of his uh, life. So yeah, that was quite different. I was used to like, you're doing a jump and it's got to feel incredibly empowering. And it says like, you've got to yeah. not be able to jump. Um, <laughs> and then also you can barely climb over a log. Was, it, was, um, there, was there a point in the game where we had a three point landing? Yeah, the yeah, first jump I did had like a matrix three point landing. <laughs> and then everyone said, don't do that, James. And then I didn't do it again. No. <laughs> so again, is that, that process of what do you think you uniquely brought to the game? So how would it look different if it was, wasn't your animation? Um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think they basically wouldn't have done the, um, the body awareness stuff. So uh, what Can I mean, you explain what you mean by yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I mean is like <clears throat> picking up and manipulating objects, for example, would probably have been more like, um, you know, like Half-Life 2 or Gone Home or something, where you have the sort of, you're essentially like a floating camera, and mm. then you invisibly, it's just sort of in your view. Um, and then in the final game, we have like, you sort of reach out and grab things, and then you can sort of mm. look at them from different angles. Or even something as simple as just looking down and being able to see your feet move when you're walking. Yeah, yeah. you can see yeah. your legs at any time in the game, and um, as you're climbing over, like we do a lot of little mm. things, like you start a day and you can, you know, you're sitting in your chair, leaning back, and you have your legs up on the table. That stuff probably just wouldn't have, necessarily been in the game. Because um, mm. you could have made Firewatch without an animator, it just would have not quite had that sense of... I think it brought a lot, I don't know if people would agree, but I think it brought a lot to the game, this idea that you felt 40-something. Mm. You didn't feel yeah. like... I mean, if you, if it, I think Gordon Freeman's a really interesting character to come back to for this, because he's essentially the 40-something, yeah. but mm. he feels like the world's mm. greatest athlete at the same yeah, time. Right, yeah. Whereas in this game, you actually felt like you were... Yeah. I mean, I'm 40 <laughs> next year. I, I know what it feels like to be nearly 40. <laughs> right. So I know how much I'm slowing down. Yeah, like most, most first-person games, uh, you're like a, like um, you're filling in the personality with yourself. Like, so you just mm. feel like, oh, I'm the Call of Duty guy. Mm. Um, and that was like incredibly... I believe that's the main yeah. character, the Call of Duty guy. <laughs> yeah, right? I, I think yeah, so, so many of the things in Firewatch are designed ex like explicitly around the idea of helping the player to inhabit Henry. And yeah. one of those things is having that full body awareness, I think is really important to that. Yeah, I hope so. Mm. I think one of the standout aspects of Firewatch are the hands. Yeah. Have you had this right. feedback a lot? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, Ralph even, even, de even like, you know, in a positive and a, and a very negative way as well. Oh, really? When we first announced the game, there were a lot of comments saying uh, that they, people yeah. didn't like the hands, um, which I think is, you know, it's, it's just, uh, when, you, when you go with a stylized direction, it's going to obviously turn some people off. People thought that we made them smaller. 
Because no, we didn't. What we, we actually did was yeah. we changed. He had very glossy fingernails in the first reveal, and people kept pointing them <laughs> out. So we just they were too we glossy. Took, yeah, we took. Maybe we, he just took care of his fingernails. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> didn't take care of the rest of himself. But the oh, <laughs> yeah, fingernails is always prioritized. Yeah, we, we, oh, and yeah. also we changed the field of the field view. The field of view just came point. out, so, so his, his hands yeah. shrunk. Um, but yeah, mm. right. So that happened. So okay, but what about the positive? What was the positive reaction? I think people just like responded well to seeing something that didn't look like a gnarled like incredibly realistic yeah. hand like poking out the screen. And but at the same time, it things. felt clumsy in a really interesting way. You didn't yeah. feel like um, you weren't a super powerful robot hand either. There was mm. a, a sense that this was a vulnerable man. It seemed mm. to come really come across to me through his just, sausagey fingers. Yeah, mm. I think that's something. Um, I think that's entirely down to James's like really expressive animation and the way that we took out some of the, some of the clumsiness as well. Actually, there's a, not like to make it less, but there was like a thing we used to start a day by trying to get your keys and you'd click on them to do a normal grab and then there's like a special animation where he'd fumble his keys and they'd go into the table and you have to crawl under and there and you bang your head. discover a cool thing under there yeah. that got That got changed. somewhere else. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so why, why was that dropped? Why would that not be? Oh, narrative Just reasons. Narrative reasons, yeah. In a game like this, yeah. it's like everything is, is yeah. like subservient to what's the story. I mean, yeah. yeah, we were talking about this earlier, but I think um, everything in the game it's like there wasn't really a process of review. Like we wouldn't sit around and say, "I think this one looks better." I think this one looks better. It would be because there were so few of us and so little time to make the game. It was very much like, if as long as it served the narrative purpose, it just got put in the game immediately, yeah. um, which meant that everyone kind of had a lot of freedom to make things exactly how they wanted, unless you know. And then you get a note from Sean saying, "This doesn't feel like Wyoming." And I'd be like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> like, so yeah. presumably there was a time delay for you guys and most of the rest of the team. Yeah, that was really, so that was really tough. Did that yeah. give you a lot more independence? So just to explain, these guys are based, yeah. based in the UK, and most yeah. of the team's yeah. based. It's just eight hours Francisco. difference. Yeah, there's eight, eight yeah. hours. Which, so I that mean, which is the workday. So you were the workday apart. Yeah, How did that work? It's really um, tricky. It, well, I think partly because um, the work it was quite compartmentalised. Uh, mm. Everyone was responsible for their own thing. It wasn't a huge. It wasn't a huge problem. I mean, what, the way that it would work for me in the early stages where I was just doing concept art um, and sort of like sketches, I, I would get up, I would do a full day's work, and then they would arrive with um, a whole day's work on their desk, and then we could discuss it. And, you know, look, and there's an hour of overlap, and we can discuss it. And then I'd have notes to go away on the next day. So in that way, it actually worked out really well. Um, but you know, there's times when everyone's like crunching to get the game done and finished, and uh, yeah, you go to bed. And you go to bed, <laughs> or, they, or they call and meet. You know, I say, everyone there's a meeting at 11 p.m. and it's going to last three hours. And you're like, oh god! Yeah, that's <laughs> like that's at the beginning, like for the first year, um, I sort of would have my work day. They get in about 5 p.m. England time, and then I just sort of have another work day, and I'd stay up till three, and then mm. they'd leave the office, and that'd be fine. Um, but then I had a baby, mm. and I wasn't allowed to do that anymore. Um, <laughs> no. So, yeah, then it's actually fine, except for meetings. That's the thing, because yeah. like, it's just really hard to actually go into the call. Quite, like, I quite liked it, though, because we used to have a little, we used to get together and have a little moan, and then cause no, one, <laughs> no one could listen to it. Yeah. <laughs> all asleep. That's true, actually. I found I got more work done for having a baby, because I was up from 1 till 6 a.m. every night. Right. With this monster <laughs> on my desk. Got loads more work done. You're lazy. That's what I've concluded. I'm quite lazy. Um, Okay, so I think what most people, if they've played Firewatch, what they're really, the question most people come away from the game with is, uh, what the hell was that thing in the middle of his room? Oh, oh the, the, the Osborne Firefinder. Ah, yes. I just want to know uh, how much time you spent. Oh, uh, okay. We totally prototyped we, that. We how much work that you guys put, spent on that thing that would never did anything? Um, originally, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in the game that I wouldn't say got cut, but, you know, every game is completely different at the end of how you imagine yeah. it at the start. And we did have systemic things like uh, stuff about triangulating fires yeah. and... Um, Think about like doing your map. I think there was some map-related stuff with it, yeah, I think and that so. just stuff just wasn't very fun. So we just took it out. You just learn what your game is as you're making it. Yeah, I f it's, and it takes ages as well. Like I, mm. you sort of learn what your game is when you're like quite far into production, mm. and then you're like, okay, from, let's gosh, it. Yeah. we've got to make it now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So lots of stuff of like that. You just like even some of the traversal stuff was we were going to have more of that possibly um, at the beginning, and. Um, and then he was like, this is mostly about hmm. having conversations in a beautiful place, so let's not bother too much with some of these other things. Um, so yeah, it just sort of gradually goes away. Do you think, was there a battle in development uh, in terms of storytelling? I think there's a lot of games recently, the, the uh, somewhat derogatory term walking simulator, mm -hmm. which I think at Rock, Paper, Shotgun we've tried to embrace as a, as a positive, as a, right, sure. as a, a good thing a game can be. Um, a lot of the uh, angle of those games is that the storytelling is environmental. Mm -hmm. right. um, in Firewatch, it seemed to 
sort of bre- it seemed to cover both both bases. There was a lot of environmental storytelling, and then it was obviously a great deal of mm. of narrative, traditional narrative storytelling. Yeah. How yeah. did those two weave together? Was there a conflict? Um, I, th- I don't think there was ever a, there was ever a conflict. I think the the narrative, the, the less traditional walking simulator stuff, where you're actually talking to the line or having the conversation, I think that was more effective. It's actually much cheaper to do as well because getting a script and getting a voice actor to record stuff is a really good way to get yeah. amazing feeling like stuff into the game. The environment, you know, environment art, you have to have an artist like making the model and then making the texture and doing all that stuff. And, I, and yeah. it's, um, I, I mean, I don't think there was ever, there was ever really a conflict. No, we, we did want it to, you know, we wanted the game to mainly be driven by mm. stuff is really happening to you in real time and it's not just like, what is this crazy place I've ended up in? I'm exploring. It's like, yeah, well, right. no, like I'm doing things. I'm mm. an agent in this world. But um, the, you have to have a bunch of the environmental stuff because that kind of informs mm. what you're doing. Like, oh, I found out this information because of this note I found. Therefore, I'm mm. going to take this action. Um, but yeah, we didn't want it to feel like a dead yes. world that you're just like picking through, like that yeah, archaeology exactly. feeling that some games have. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, it was important that we didn't do that. Yeah, and uh, there's, I mean, we had to sort of come up with creative ways to have those environmental storytelling moments because at the end of the day, it is like the wilderness, yeah. and we didn't want it to be to feel like the house had gone home. And having the density of stuff was actually quite difficult to achieve. In that yeah, way. it's tricky because like you don't want it to yeah. be boring going through a zone, but then mm. also like every inch of the Yosemite or whatever um, wouldn't be. Yeah, you don't want to fill it full of like collectibles to an extreme <laughs> to an extreme degree. Like, to be with beer cans instead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Brilliant. Um, I think it'd be really good if we could go to Q and A. Um, a microphone shall magically appear. Um, uh, are we coming to them or are they coming to us? We're going to them. Uh, does anyone have a question uh, for these guys? Over there. Oh, brilliant. So can you come around to the microphone here? Sorry, mm. my bad. If anyone else has any questions burning in their brain, feel free to form a line behind and we can uh, get through as many as we can. Hello. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask if uh, you guys, I guess, uh, are more of an independent company. Um, how do you go on about finances, and how do you kind of survive as an independent company? Do do you guys work anything besides doing the game, or um, do you, does the revenue off the game? Sure. Uh, my situation is a bit different to James's because yeah. I didn't take any money to work on the game um, until re- I, I forestalled my payment. Uh, because I thought, I mean, they actually offered, they offered to pay, but I thought if I can afford to pay myself by doing freelance on the side, then we can hire another person and the game will be better by having another person working on it. Um, but we actually, we took money from a publisher to, to make the game. We had a great deal with a company called Panic that gave us complete creative control. Um, and we got to own the IP and everything, and, but you know, still keep the lights on. And when we delayed, they, we had to ask for more money, and they were very... Yeah, it was great. They're, yeah, not, they're, they're not like a... Tragi- this is their first game mm. they'd funded. They're, they're a software company themselves, and they make, like, I'm not, like Mac utilities. Yeah, they make uh, Transmit and um, yeah. Coder and a bunch of, like, uh, yeah. stuff for Macs. Really uh, it's, an, it's another, like, connections over the Internet type thing. Like, yeah, Jake they, just knows <laughs> Jake knows, knows them everyone. because he used to make skins for their MP3 player in yes. the 90s. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so he just... Him and Sean arranged, like... A, Having had experience in the past with deals at major publishers, yeah. a fabulously, ridiculously um, well, we smart did, we, deal. We originally, we originally did take meetings with with a bunch of people because Sean and Jake just came off The Walking Dead and mm, right. had a lot of people interested in, in working with them on something. And we, you know, we took regular publisher meetings, but you know, oh god, there was one. It's like, hey, we like your game, but what if you made it? Like just franchise. <laughs> what if you put it in like the mafia universe? You know, like, <laughs> and what, uh, what would you guys say is more important to you, the, the money or the independence of, of freedom of control? Of the, the independence project? and the freedom of control, definitely. There's yeah. no, no question. By a massive uh, margin. I think everybody on the team did work, like took massive, like everyone took massive pay cuts. Yeah. Because they wanted to make a game that they could be really proud of. Um, and whether that is the case for everyone, I hope it is. But. Um, <laughs> But okay. yeah, yeah. They, definitely, definitely. Yeah, that answers the money. Is not, Thank you. Is not Appreciate Thank that. you very much. Hi there. Um, Hi. Oh, that's loud. Uh, when you're creating the art style for your game, do you ever think about how it'll age in time? So some games are tied to sheer graphical fidelity of the time, and then years to come, they'll end up looking dated, while right. some that 
focus less on the hardware limitations of the time end up looking better in years to come and will still look good in 10 years' time. So do you ever think about that when you're... Hmm. I, I think about that for sure. I want every game I make to be something you can go back to be, and... To be, have an ageless beauty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I tend not to think about how it's going to be played in the future. I mean, like, we didn't know if anyone would want to play it in the future. I don't know. Maybe, maybe in 10 years, people go back and look at it and it'll be fine. I imagine it seems quite normal for the gaming yeah, world. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think I was just... I never really thought about the future. I just wanted to make what I was interested in at that specific moment. And, but then... At the same time, my style has never been particularly like um, realistic or, or yeah, detailed. we weren't relying on that so stuff. I, yeah, so I, I'm, and the work that I tend to like, the work that I'm inspired by, is stuff from the 60s and the 50s that I guess hasn't a or has aged very well as well. So there's probably something to that. But I wasn't specifically trying to create a style that that wouldn't age. But James, you said you were thinking about that. I I, mm. I mean, not like I was making it up, but. Um, I care about that quite a lot, and I think that Firewatch naturally fits into that quite nicely because of the stylized mm. rendering and stuff. It's not like how sick is our depth of field technology? Yeah. Do we have? Bokka? It's pretty sick though. It's pretty. It's, <laughs> it's quite sick actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we don't rely on all those bells and whistles yeah. too much. So yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi guys. Um, I was wondering what sort of order did the process of making the game take? Did it all come? Was the narrative all kind of? there and finalized first before then everybody else was brought on to build the world or did it kind of develop as you were as you were making the um, game and you think this works better we should change this about the plot I mean, or something. It, developed a lot it, 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 it develops a lot I mean the, the core of it was always about three people in the woods it was going to be like Henry Delilah and uh, Goodwin I almost said Blooker which was our Blooker code name yeah. <laughs> was our code name for him during development um, and some of the stuff around that changed, but the core of it remained really similar. The artwork didn't really change. We, we didn't, I mean, I, I, when I started designing the way I wanted the world to look, it felt like a sort of very pie in the sky, like, what if it was this, what if it was this? And we actually came really remarkably close, close to, yeah. to hitting it. Um, but, I, and things definitely changed. There was some big story stuff that changed towards the end of development, but it was always yeah. in service of like the original idea. We never. Mm had a big change at any point where we said, oh, God, what we're doing isn't working. We have to go back. And no, were you like ever tempted by a happy ending? Sorry? Were you ever tempted by a happy ending? Um, no. No, no okay. I, just, if I can see I that mean, the, like, the yeah, pressure could be really there. There was, no, there was never a moment where, where we, you, know, how, we're gonna, you were going to meet Delilah at the end. No, like, that was no. That was completely off the table. We, we didn't want to do that, not least because I don't think it could possibly, like, technically live up to your expectation created by that amazing voice performance throughout the game. But, yeah, so, I mean, um, <clears throat> so like Sean quite often did like Twine games, mm. um, which anyone doesn't know what Twine is, it's like, it's like how the game begins, where there's a text adventure, you're choosing mm. options. Um, and like, I remember really early on playing a Twine of the ending of the game, and it wasn't a one-to-one -one match of how the game ends now, but it was pretty damn yeah, pretty close. close. Even um, things like, well, very early, I wish I, had a, um, I wish I had a picture of this because I should have, I should have brought it. I'm an idiot, but even though we had this color script at the beginning of the game, which was a very, yeah. very rough, tiny sort of like one inch by one inch sketches of the, of the way the time of day changes and the tone changes and the forest fire starts burning and the atmosphere closes in. And if you look at it now, it's basically the entire game, like nothing changed. And that yeah. was done probably sort of a, long a year before the game shipped or maybe, yeah. maybe even more than it's that. It's also funny things like the first thing I did for Firewatch mm. when I wasn't even like really on board yet was um, like an animation previs, and it had sort of looking down, seeing your legs, um, holding up a radio, looking at the sun and covering your eyes, and then finding a rope and descending into a hole on a rope. And it's like, that sort of is the game. <laughs> yeah. So we got quite close to that, yeah. yeah. So t to come back to the question, the, you were, the, the core of story idea was, was set. Yes. Um, yeah, well, I'd say like plot changed throughout development, but yeah. character didn't so character much. Character didn't really change. The only thing that changed um, character was when the voices were cast, because then... Um, with well, the, yeah, the, perfor the, the, the performances would inform the writing. Yeah, the, the but not so much the core involved. of the characters. But the core like of the characters was always the same. The core of the story was always the same. Um, yeah, I get the feeling that's just sort of how Sean starts things. He yeah. starts with a character and then he builds out from yeah, that. Yeah, I think that's probably true. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank oh, you. Thanks. Cheers, good question. Hi. Um, I just wanted to know, this is more directed at Ollie, but um, okay. I wanted to know what it was like going from a graphic design background to a more concept art-based background, or if you all were, were always interested in concept art. Um, yeah, it was, something, it was something I was really interested in. I'd never actually painted like a landscape before I started working on Firewatch. They said, can you do this? And I was like, no, probably, it's fine. Um, but 
Yeah, that definitely it was like teaching myself how to do things a lot. T thinking in 3D was definitely something that came eventually, but was quite hard to get used to. Um, I mean, my work outside of games is very uh, focused on like composition and color. And color is easy to transfer to games because obviously yeah, it's yeah. about communicating tone and in video games, like communicating um, meaning and even like where you need to go or what you need to do next. And that's very similar to graphic design in which you're using colors and things to communicate. However, the um, composition is really tough because, I mean, when you're composing the shapes yourself, it's really easy. However, when you give the player the control of the camera to look wherever they want, uh, it's, you have to try and create environments that give the, the player the best chance to like, act, like frame the shot in a way that's really like, pleasing to them, but also communicates where they need to go in the level as well. It's, um, so it was, that was a really big change, actually, to, to start thinking about things as an explorable place rather than a, just a picture. So before Firewatch, you'd never worked on a game before? No, never. No. no. Okay. Um, I really wanted to for a really long time. Uh, it was a time where I almost started working on something with Phil Fish. Um, <laughs> And then that didn't happen because he quit games forever. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, it was my first game, and, uh, but I hopefully not my last because I really enjoyed it. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thanks. Cheers. Uh, hi, sorry. Uh, my question is actually pretty similar to hers. Okay. But uh, I was going to ask uh, what kind of limitations did you, or did you run into any limitations yeah. from transferring to 3D? Hmm. Oh, from transferring to 3D. Um, not really. I mean, there were times when I, when I think I wish I could model this myself or I wish I could do this myself just because I found it quite difficult to communicate sometimes like the way, the way something should change. But Jane is an incredible, Jane Ng, our uh, environment artist, is an incredibly talented modeler and would basically just nail everything like first time. Um, so there wasn't really that much fr frustrated. There were, for me, not having worked in a game before and being put in a, a position where, of responsibility where I had to learn things pretty quickly um, there were definitely times when I felt frustrated by my lack of like ability to just make a thing exactly the way I wanted it to be, but uh, at the end of the day, it, it's it's everybody's game, and you just have to sort of accept that things were going to be. The, the I also think that like when you do a painter, a lot of time um, mm. Jane would do a sort of block out of a yeah. zone, and then Ollie would paint over it. And yeah, she she wouldn't um, turn in something finished and say that's what it is. You'd do like a rough one, and then and she'd send it to me, and I would like then take it into Photoshop and start painting over. Like no, remove this tree, change this over here, make the sky this color, um, and then uh, send it back, and it would be sort of like tennis. We'd go back and forth on on an area until it was a, it, in a place where we both found it um, where. It, where we both liked it. Uh, although, I, but towards the end of it, I got a bit more competent at actually working in the game, and I did. You did quite a bit. I stuff. did like all the lighting in the yeah. game, which was which was yeah. surprising. I never thought when I started out that I would be that hands-on with it, and it ended up. Actually and I'd assume that you'd, you'd sort of go more and more in that direction in the future. Basically. Yeah, I think if we start, if we if I started another game tomorrow, I'd definitely be doing more of the more of the hands-on like yeah. modeling and stuff. But James, like are really you similarly you move from a two D game to a three D game? Now you've done three D animation before. Well, but the thing was that Ori is all. It's all in terms of the animation, it's all faked. It's all 3D. Oh, right. And then rendered to sprites. I gave a talk on this at GDC like a year ago. But, um, so, you know, it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's all fine. Thank you. Yeah, no, cool. Thanks. Cheers. Hiya. Hi. Uh, I was always really fascinated by the, the advertising the game got, where it kind of, I can't remember where it was shown off before, I want to say E3 2014 or something like that, where over the course of the next two years, it was kind of given very... 10 second teasers and mm. these like uh, mm. Ollie mentioned he worked on uh, come see the site sort of things beforehand and yeah. the, these posters kept getting released of like come to Wyoming Wilderness yeah, sure. I wanted to know if you had any input on what you wanted to show off in things like this whether it was mainly just all internal um, no I, we did yeah. I, I mean, mean we all, we, it was every decision basically every decision everyone on the team had like an input in. everyone mucked in a lot I mean like obviously yeah. Ollie w mucked in enormously so, in that yeah, you did all the posters for and PR and we didn't really have a PR agency until like right at the end we didn't really even then did we, we just had like one person we had one person helping out with um, emails and all that stuff but yeah. Jake and Chris uh, Chris Rumo are sort of like music and sound guy and also community guy I guess he's just and he's like a great, polymath yeah, he's really genius good. polymath man um we, we were kind of the people that had the most experience with marketing and, and we kind of tended to take the lead on that stuff. Um, but then we had a very like specific attitude to marketing, which is that you just make an entertaining thing and then that kind of Trojan horses the idea of the game into people's minds. I mean, like, 
I remember when we had some brief meetings with some PR people who I won't name, but they were like, we just want to make something fun and shareable. And it was just trash. Everything they were making was like really bad. And the way to make fun, something fun and shareable is you make something good and then people will share it. You don't, it yeah. It's yeah. amazing how many people don't understand that. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, I, and marketing was also, like, I know a lot of indie game makers, they don't enjoy it, but we saw it as an opportunity to make, because we all like making things. We just like the act of, like, making a cool thing, and it just felt like an opportunity to make something interesting that, you know, wasn't working on the game. So it was like a nice little break from, from that while we could, uh, we could focus on making something good. Thank you. I think we only have time for one more question. Sorry to the oh, person no. who's just joined the line. Uh, Please go ahead. Uh, my question is uh, for James. Uh, what's Can you come a bit closer like, to the mic? Sorry, sorry. Uh, what's like the uh, turnaround for like general animations you do? Do you do like uh, reference where you film your hands, or is it all come out your head, or how does it work? Um, this is going to be a, just such a bad answer, but um, I don't use any reference when I animate things, and I don't block in things, and I don't really show pre-viz like poses to people. I just sorry, can you explain pre-viz? Um, so, uh, you, uh, tra traditionally, you might be like, okay, we're doing our jumping off the cliff animation, and then yeah. you'd show the director or whoever, <laughs> other people on the team, like, well, it's going to start like with this pose, then this pose, then this pose, and they get a sense of it. Okay. And yeah. I generally basically don't do any of the clever things you're supposed to do when you make animation, yeah. and instead I just do it end to end. One take. That's all you get. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so for all that, I mean, for literally yeah. everything, I guess I just um, do it. And, the only, and then the feedback base comes, if it's bad, then they go, do it again, and then I do it again. Uh, but yeah, so the no helpful tips and tricks, just animate straight ahead and do a good job if you can. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for That's much. amazing. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. We yeah, need to wrap up now. Um, don't forget to visit Rock Paper Shotgun's booth, if you could, with the left field collection right opposite it. Um, and I hope you have a brilliant uh, rest of rest. Um, and it'd be awesome if you could join me in thanking Ollie Moss and James Benson. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, John. You can see the biggest developers live. You can see the biggest developers live and play a huge range of unreleased games at EGX 2016 in Birmingham from the 22nd to the 25th of September. The UK's biggest games event is going even bigger this year, with more space and more screens to make it our best ever. Play this year's hits first, see developers live and check out the spectacular cosplay stage, gigantic retro selection plus sessions and talks on getting into the games industry.